today, I mean, I know over the last couple of weeks, we've had some of the big ones. We've had the Mark of the Beast. We've had 666, the number. Uh, we've had the Great Dragon. Um, today, we've got another very famous theme. I wouldn't say a very famous chapter of Scripture because if you ask most people, even probably Christians, where, where do you find the Battle of Armageddon? They might say, oh, maybe in Revelation somewhere. Uh, but today we have the Battle of Armageddon today, which should be hopefully very encouraging for us. Uh, remember today, as, as we've been going through uh, the last probably three or four weeks, when we started with the seals, the seven seals, then we had the seven trumpets, and then we had uh, the, the unholy trinity, and then um, today we're going to have seven plagues, seven bowls. So again, lots of number sevens. Remember, what we're seeing in the letter of revealing Jesus isn't a forward-looking, future-looking, sequential, chronological outline of future events. That's not what we're looking at in the letter of revealing Jesus. It's more like we're looking at <clears throat> uh, the, the, the world, the way it is right now, the way it's been in the past, and the way it will be in the future. And we see windows into different aspects of reality, both the material and the spiritual, and we see different aspects of history. We've seen way back from creation. We've seen way forward to uh, the, the culmination of this age. We've seen what's the reality of the world we've been living in for the last 1,900 years since this letter was written. So we've, we're seeing like a snapshot of all different kinds of things. And as we get to these, these groups of sevens, as we get to the seven seals, the seven, bo- uh, seven trumpets, seven plagues, seven bowls, what we're kind of seeing is it's kind of like uh, an action replay of the same event over and over and over again. I don't know if, you've, if you're into footy or if you're into uh, I don't know, boxing or whatever, but it's kind of like, here comes the, the killer blow, kabam! And one, you know, he's in the middle of the air, the, the enemy, and then you get to see it from another angle, there he is, kabam, the finishing blow, and then he hits the ground, then you see it from another angle, and then the top angle, and then in slow-mo, kabam! That's kind of what we're seeing in Revelation. You see it over and over and over again. The great foe hits the deck, and from different angles, we see in the seven seals a call for perseverance for the saints and the knowledge that God is going to make all things new, and every injustice will be made right. You see in the seven trumpets this call to the nations to repentance. We see a lot of one-thirds, one-third of the sun and the stars, one-third of the rivers, one-third of the sea life, one-third of the earth. Is, ju- is judged, and it's like a it's, a, it's a taste of the judgment to come. In fact, what we're going to see today. And it's a, come on, people, repent. Come back to me. Don't put your hopes in any of these kinds of things. And then today, we're going to see, actually, the great finality of God's judgment, actually. We've seen um, a bunch of times that, that what well, we've reminded ourselves a bunch of times, this letter, it was written to a group of people in its time. This is not a letter that somebody that John wrote or a vision that he got from Jesus and he sealed it up and kept it somewhere hidden until 2020. And then we unwrapped it. We're like, oh, it's the, we've got a global pandemic and uh, we've got uh, wars and rumors of wars. We've got something else. This is just for our time right now. No, no, it is for our time now, but it's also been for every time since it's writing until now to the point where we want to remind ourselves that if it doesn't make sense to the first readers, it doesn't make sense for us today. It's got to make sense to the first readers. So it can't mean something uniquely for our day that it didn't mean for them. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not future events um, talked about, but those are future events hoped for by the very first readers like they are hoped for for us right now. There are... difficulties, there are persecutions, there are tribulations, there is death that was coming upon the first readers that's coming upon people in our day. I find it not hilarious, but what I've been doing, trying to do uh, in my research for this study, for this series, has been to try to read and listen to people from all different kinds of perspectives on the letter of revealing Jesus. There are a lot of people who are 
who make a lot of speculations about things from this letter that uniquely apply only to our time right now, and even if you, do, if you kind of distill it even further, to a uniquely Western and even perhaps a uniquely American perspective where people say, well, things are getting worse and worse and persecution's ramping up, therefore this must be happening in our day. I think that's such a narrow view, myopic view of Scripture and of the reality of the world right now, where there have been people across the world, across the last 1900 years, who have been persecuted, brutalized, hunted down and murdered for their faith in Jesus. And now that there are some old white American dudes who are all of a sudden reading Revelation and thinking, oh, this is uniquely for us now because it's more difficult now than it was 70 years ago when we hold cultural and political sway in this Western hemisphere. Uh, is such a myopic view of Scripture. We don't want to fall into that trap. Revelation is an apocalyptic letter. Apocalyptic, again, meaning a revealing, an unveiling. And who or what is it trying to unveil? Not to tell us about some future events, but to help us understand the world as it is now and who is sitting on the throne now. That's what we're looking at in the letter of revealing Jesus. As we come to the seven bowls, seven gold bowls, seven plagues, the things that we will read today, <clears throat> like you might, you might have been thinking up to now, there have been some fairly severe judgments in Revelation so far. It's going to be much more severe today. And what we want, don't want to do, I'm about to read these two chapters, what we don't want to do is apply our 2022 Western sensibilities and sit in the seat of judgment over God and say, well, if I was God, I would be much more merciful than this. If I was God, I wouldn't judge people like this. This sounds very harsh. And this is one of the reasons why over and over and over again in this letter, we've seen not just a picture of the world, the material world as it is now, and the spiritual world as it is now, but we see a picture of heaven and the glory and the grandeur, the majesty, the holiness and the perfection of the one who sits on the throne to help us understand that everything he does is perfect. All of his ways are righteous and just. So as we come to this passage today, just a small preface, we don't want to sit in judgment over God. That is the fool's seat. We want to understand what is being revealed, what's being unveiled about the world and about Jesus as we read it. How does that sound? You're just thinking, I can't wait to get to the battle of the battle of Armageddon. All right, let's have a read. Revelation 15. Then, so I'm building on everything else that's happened. Man, John, he's probably getting tired by now, right? There's, he's seen a lot so far. Then I saw another great and awe-inspiring sign in heaven. Seven angels with the seven last plagues, for with them God's wrath will be completed. So there's something we've seen in a bunch of times already between the sixth seal and the seventh seal between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, there's a kind of a rest, a pause. And then when the seventh comes, that's the end. That's the completion. And then there's another seven. How is that? I thought we finished it already. Remember, we're just singing the same thing from different angles, the reality of how the world is right now and what's to come. I also saw something like a glass, like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had won the victory over the beast, its image and the number of its name were standing on the sea of glass with harps from God. They sang the song of God's servant Moses and the song of the Lamb. Great and awe-inspiring are your works. This is the song. Lord God, the Almighty, just and true are your ways. King of the nations, Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship before you because your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I looked in the heavenly temple. The tabernacle of testimony was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with seven plagues, dressed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes wrapped around their chests. One of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. Then the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So the, the vision given to John is setting the scene. God in His glory surrounded by all of the saints who all have harps. So we're all musicians in heaven. How awesome is that? 
praising him with the song of Moses, which will come in, like we need to know that soon when we get to the next chapter. And they're just worshipping him in his, in his greatness, in his perfection, in his justice. And then these seven angels come out. One of the four living creatures gives these seven angels golden bowls filled with God's judgment. Then, chapter 16, I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first went and poured out his bowl on the earth and severely painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped its image. The second poured out his bowl into the sea. It turned to blood like that of a dead person and all life in the sea died. So remember a couple weeks ago, a third of the sea life died. This week, all of the sea life dies. The third poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. I heard the angel of the waters say, You are just the Holy One who is and who was, because you have passed judgment on these things, because they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and have, you have given them blood to drink, and they deserve it. I heard the altar say, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth bowl poured out his bowl on the sun. It was allowed to scorch people with fire and people were scorched by the intense heat. So they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. The fifth poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues because of their pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they did not repent of their works. The sixth poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its waters were dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming from the dragon's mouth, from the beast's mouth, and from the mouth of the false prophet. For they were demonic spirits performing signs who traveled to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for the battle on the great day of the Lord, the Almighty. And then we have Jesus speaking. Look, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who's alert and remains clothed so that he may not go around naked and people see his shame. So they assembled the kings at the place in Hebrew called Armageddon. The seventh put out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. There were flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder and a severe earthquake occurred like no other since people have been on the earth. So great was the quake. The great city split into three parts and the, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered in God's presence. He gave her the cup filled with the wine of his fierce anger. Every island fled, and the mountains disappeared. Enormous hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, fell from the sky on people, and they blasphemed God for the plague of hell because the plague was extremely severe. All right, we've got a lot of ground to cover today. Let's pray, and we'll seek God's understanding. Father God, like every week, we gather around your scriptures, we need your help. Please, Father, help us to have understanding of these things we're reading. We don't want to be deceived or distracted. We just want to know your truth, be about your business, and bring you glory with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So again today, we've got another round of seven. Seven again, big number in Scripture. Seven days of creation. I mean, it's really six days of creation, right? But on the seventh day, God enters rest. Seven days, they marched, people of God marched around Jericho, or six days. Seventh day, the walls, the barriers to entering into God's promised land come tumbling down, and the people of God enter their rest. Fast forward to Revelation, we've seen six seals of hardship for the people of God, and then they enter their rest. We've seen six calls for the people of the nations to repent and then God bringing his judgment. But today, again, we see six bowls of of judgment being poured out onto the earth and on the seventh day, it is done. It's finished. This is kind of an, it's an echo of, um, it's an echo of creation in kind of an inverted way, where we see in creation over six days, uh, the earth and the, the stars and the rivers and uh, the beasts being created. And here we see 
kind of a de-creation event as this age was wrapped up. We also, uh, you would have been hearing echoes of the Exodus plagues in these plagues. That is absolutely deliberate. The first readers would have had that top of mind. The plagues coming. Uh, Moses, even we talked about the Song of Moses, and these plagues coming, uh, many of them, like frogs and water turning to blood and things like this, direct kind of hyperlinks back to that story. But let's start from chapter 15. There's another sign, a sea of glass and fire, somehow. Those two, the two things work together. All those who won victory over the beast were there. And you might think to yourself, hang on a second, in a couple of chapters, the beast is waging war against the people of God. And in the next chapter, the, the beast and the unholy trinity are sending out demons to gather all of the people uh, from the nations to wage war against God and his people. How are the people all safe with God if in the future events they're also being killed or pursued by the beast? Again, this is not a chronological timeline that we're looking at in, in the letter of Revealing Jesus. They're worshipping God with the song of Moses. And then we see these seven angels with the seven plagues, now with seven bowls, echoing, not just the song of Moses echoing from the people of God, but now we're seeing the plagues of Moses being echoed in the vision. Seven, like you might know, there weren't seven plagues back in the Exodus, but again, seven is important in this apocalyptic literature because it means the complete number, the totality, the completeness of God's judgment is being poured out in these plagues. And so what we're, when we're reading about these seven bowls, we're supposed to be thinking, oh, not there's some future event where I need to look for hailstones from the sky and to look for the sun being more potent than normal. Uh, it's supposed to make us think back to the Exodus. Not forward, but backward to the Exodus. We go, oh, this is just like the Exodus. But God delivers his people. And those who, on whom he pours out his judgment don't repent, they harden their hearts. That's what we're supposed to be thinking because that's the echo we hear. That's the recapitulation we're hearing here. Also, the seven bowls are a direct echo of the seven trumpets. If you have a look at what's affected, just like the seven trumpets, in the same order with the seven bowls, we see the earth affected, then the sea affected, then the rivers being affected, then the sun, uh, people, an army of demonic forces is unleashed. Um, and then with the seventh bowl, seventh plague, seventh trumpet, seventh seal, finish. God's rule and reign. We see this again and again and again. This is why, again, we can say these are not sequential chronological future events. These are different windows into the reality of the world right now and past and future events. And then at the end, just like we've seen a number of times now, we see the throne of God descending to the earth, denoted by thunder, lightning, rumblings, and a huge earthquake. And this time, it's an earthquake like the world has never seen before, because this is the picture of the end. So let's have a look at those in great detail. The earth, the ground, somehow is impacted with this first bowl, first plague. But it doesn't say the ground uh, is impacted and then you know, all of the trees die. It says the ground's affected and then the people start to die, start to get worse, start to get um, problems, sick, possibly pointing to all of the food sources being destroyed, kind of like the gnats in Exodus. Then the sea, there's no food on the land, can't go to the sea because the sea has been totally wiped out as well. Uh, we see in creation, the sea is there, and then all of a sudden the sea's teeming with life. Now as the bowls are being poured out, the decreation event is happening, no more life in the sea. No hope for the sea. Can't, can't run to the rivers even for water. Can't have fresh drinking water because you go to the sea and it's been turned to blood. Again, echoing the Exodus account of the blood. And man, this is a this is an amazing like little paragraph of scripture where we see this is what it says, uh, Revelation 16. I heard the angel of the water say, You are just the Holy One 
who is and who was, because you've passed judgment on these things, because, because they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, you have given them blood to drink and they deserve it. I heard the altar say, yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. So saying, because the nations spilled the blood of the saints, now all they have to drink is the blood of the saints. And they deserve it. You can't drink blood and survive. You drink blood and you die. Then the altar here is uh, anthropomorphized, like as if the altar can speak. And the altar, remember the altar from a few chapters ago, where the saints who've been martyred and murdered are under the altar. And they, they are praying to God, calling out for justice. And the prayers go up like incense to God. Now the altar who's been housing or covering these saints, figuratively, the altar's crying out saying, yes, here it is. This is the justice the saints have been crying out for. The angel agrees. The angel says, you are just, the Holy One, who is and who was. And you might be thinking, yeah, who is and who was? We've heard that a couple of times in Revelation already. Who is and who was and is to come. How come the angel omits the and who is to come now? Because, obviously, now he has come. It's amazing. Who he is now, who was, but he's not yet to come. He has come. He, he is now. The next bowl is the sun. All shelter from the sun is gone as God continues to wrap up the end of the age. And all the people have hard hearts like Pharaoh. None of them repent. We saw a few weeks ago, some people repented. This week, nobody's repenting. The fifth bowl poured out on the throne of the beast. As we've seen, the throne of the beast is uh, those cities and governments and human institutions set up against God and his people. And they poured into the dark, they, uh, they are plunged into darkness. Not a physical darkness. Again, the sun is scorching hotter and harder than ever before. People are uh, getting, again, brutalized by the judgment of the sun. So it's a different kind of darkness. It's a spiritual darkness, like a groping about. We have no hope. We put all our hope in the governmental institutions. We put all our hope in these things that we have built, and now there is no hope to be found in them. We are hopeless. No anchor remaining, nowhere to go, nothing to do, but still no repentance. The sixth bowl is the drying up of the Euphrates. This happens actually a bunch of times in Scripture, uh, the drying up of the Euphrates, or, or is uh, prophesied or in, comes in a vision. To remind us of the receding of the Red Sea as God delivers his people and the closing over onto the people pursuing God's people. Or the opening up of the Jordan as God's people go into the promised land. Again, it's the picture of God's people being delivered and God's people entering into rest is the drying up of the rivers. After captivity in Babylon, um, God dries up the Euphrates so they can actually get back to the promised land. But also that's how the enemies of, of Babylon come into Babylon and God brings out his judgment on them. So it denotes a removal of the barrier for the deliverance of God and the judgment on the enemies of God. There's also these frog-like unclean spirits coming from the accuser and the beast and the dragon's mouths, assembling kings from all over the world for battle. Here it is, we finally got there, the battle of Armageddon. And again, the frogs, I think just to echo the Exodus account, but it's important coming out of their mouths as their primary weapon, like we looked at a couple weeks ago, is deception and lies. So six bowls, like the six trumpets, six seals, six days marching around Jericho, six days of creation comes right before the finish, right before the rest, right before the deliverance, right before justice comes. And when we get to the seven, it means we're about to rest. It means we're about to see Jesus win. And we're about to celebrate his victory with all of the saints. 
And the seventh trumpet is about to confirm, and we already know, that the wrath of the beast can be endured, but the wrath of God is seven, is complete. There's no escaping the wrath of God. There's no mitigating the wrath of God. His ways are perfect. All his ways are just. So before the six and the seven, we have this battle of Armageddon, famous battle, echoing battles or visions of battles we see in Ezekiel uh, 38, Zechariah 14. So again, these readers would have been hearing these famous battles echo in their minds. The most crazy part about the battle of Armageddon, I don't know what you know about the battle of Armageddon. We see uh, these like frog demons going out uh, and collecting all of the kings from all of the nations to come and battle against God at this place in Hebrew called Armageddon. Actually, there's no place called Armageddon uh, in Hebrew. Uh, there's places that sound like that, so they speculate it might be the valley of this or the hill range of that, or it might actually be uh, when Jesus uh, from Zechariah, I think, standing on the Mount of Olives on this day and massive earthquake divides a thing and there's the Valley of Armageddon or mountains on the sides or whatever it is. Um, the interesting thing about it is there's no battle. So the Battle of Armageddon, least impressive battle ever. I mean, genuinely, I, I, again, in, in watching uh, YouTube and listening and reading this week, hearing people fearfully watching the news for events happening out of Israel and the Middle East generally, or looking at places uh, like Zechariah and Ezekiel, those passages, and going, oh, well, Gog and Magog, that's east of the Euphrates. That's what he's talking about here. And that must mean Russia. And now we see Russia on the move or Iran on the move, or insert whatever the place you like to watch here on the move, and this must mean this, and this must mean that, and all of these nations are going to come, and, and they're going to battle against God. My question is, how are they going to do that? It's the most ridiculous concept. These people are going to battle against God somehow on a hill that doesn't exist, in Israel somewhere. We've already seen a couple of times what the, the battle of Armageddon looks like. It's Jesus ruling and reigning. Uh, he says he's on a cloud and he sends an angel to harvest the earth. We've seen a couple of weeks time, Jesus riding on a on white horse, a sword comes out of his mouth and that's it. There is no battle. There's no battle. This isn't some, just some future thing where you need to be fearful of or watching for or any of those kinds of things. The, the worst part about it is if we are trying to like watch the news or listen to people who are political commentators trying to, trying to rail us up, we actually miss what the battle of Armageddon is, try, is trying to reveal to us in Scripture, which is that the battle's going on now. Satan is prowling now. This isn't a future thing we're waiting for. Oh my goodness, we're doing awesome now. But in the future, Satan's going to be coming against God's people. We might be able to say that in the comfort of Adelaide in 2022, probably the most wealthy, safe, comfortable, peaceful city that has ever existed in the history of the world. Possibly we're up there, okay? Well, we're further away from danger, except for Perth, than any other city our size probably that's ever existed. And we miss that, actually, in a spiritual sense. There's already a battle going on. The dragon and the beast are already raging against God and his people. These demonic forces are already in the world, gathering people against God. This isn't a future where here come the frogs out to gather the people. No, they've been gathering since the day this was written. Deceiving spirits already at work, 
already trying to get you to abandon your faithfulness to God and swap his seal for their seal. Paul warned the Ephesians about this before this letter was written. Before the letter of revealing Jesus was written, Paul writes, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. That's what our battle's against now, our current, our present battle. This present darkness. Not a future battle, present battle. What's the future battle? It's Jesus speaking and whew, it's done. That's the future battle. How can you be afraid of that battle when you are on the side of the one with the sword? We're not afraid of that battle. That's not a fearful future. This is supposed to be encouraging and comforting to people who are being brutalized and murdered. But don't, don't worry, you know who we serve. We serve the one who's on the throne. It's why the throne keeps coming up over and over and over again. And you know how the final battle's gonna finish? No battle at all. Jesus will just speak. He is the word. And it's done. The battle's now. Second Corinthians 10, although we live in the flesh, we don't wage war according to the flesh, since the weapons of our warfare, our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the, demolish, for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that's raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ, and we are ready to punish any disobedience once your obedience is complete. So we have been given divine power, power from God in His Holy Spirit with His Scriptures to destroy strongholds because the battle is for our thinking. This is why the weapons of the unholy trinity come out of their mouths. Remember, we looked at this a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, Distraction, death are two of um, the enemy's weapons. And distraction is a big one, like distracting our hearts. Death is nothing to Christians, our own death at least, because in Christ we've seen the death of the power of death. And in fact, death is gain for Christians. So the real battle we have left, that he has left, is deception. And he's been working on this deception uh, for thousands of years now. What's the warning from Jesus? Jesus says, so there's a little quote here from Jesus, attributed to Jesus. He doesn't say, so watch the news. Watch the Middle East. Keep an eye on Russia and Iran. He doesn't say those things. I'm not saying disregard Russia and Iran, uh, you know, from a, from a worldly perspective. Go for it. But not because they're going to feature heavily in the Battle of Armageddon uniquely in our day. What does he tell us to do right in the midst of this battle? He says, make sure you're wearing the clothes of righteousness when I come like a thief. No one's going to know when I come. This is Jesus talking. He says, you don't know when I'm going to come. You don't know when these things are going to happen. He's specifically speaking to us today who are enamored with the times and the signs of the times and try to determine what are the, what are the signs of the times. He's saying, you are worrying about the wrong things. Abandon that foolishness. And make sure you're wearing the right clothes which we'll see in a couple of weeks, are our works of righteousness, clothed with our righteousness that comes from Jesus. Because he's, he's telling us, I'm coming like a thief. You're not going to know. You're not going to be able to decipher it. There's not actually going to be a drawing up of the Euphrates and a, a gathering of people somewhere on a hill somewhere. This is apocalyptic language to help us understand there's a battle going on right now. And how do we win the battle? We are clothed in righteousness, and we put all our hope on Jesus. That's it. We're reminded in the text expressly so that we don't speculate about the times. Look to you know, geopolitical machinations and movements. This is about Christ's return, and it's imminent. That's what he's saying. And it has been imminent for 1,900 years. This is not a letter uniquely written to us in the West in 2022. It's written to a group of seven churches back in the first century, but it's for 
every Christian for all time. Then the seventh poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. Again, where is the battle? There is no battle. Does it even say there's a battle? Does it even say there's a battle? We'll see a battle in a couple weeks. But again, there's no actual there's no actual battle. It's done. Then there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. And a severe earthquake occurred like no other since people have been on the earth. So great was the quake. Again, we just see Jesus win. When it is time, when the seven comes, when, it's, when it is completed, justice is done. Every wrong has been made right. Creation has been redeemed. Like this age has been wound down. And Jesus sits on the throne. And again, we see the signs of the throne on the earth because Jesus has come to rule and to reign with us. The rest of the chapter uh, kind of echoes, again, Ezekiel 38. Um, and the, the goal, the whole idea of Revelation 15 and 16 is about giving the original hearers and us confidence that no matter what the world looks like, no matter how in the battle you know you are or feel you are, or even if you're completely ignorant of the battle that's going on right now, we are to be clothed in garments of righteousness given us by Christ. Death, death, I should say, to the deceivers whispering or sometimes yelling in our ears. And along with the people of God, we worship him and watch him win. First readers, when they read these things, then their, their response isn't fear. Their response is comfort. Their response is, oh, I, I'm not supposed to get wrapped up in the, this battle, which is no battle at all. I'm not supposed to get wrapped up in the, where do we start? We are all around the throne, worshipping our King Jesus, who's victorious. And we hear this echo of Exodus, God saving his people and punishing his enemies and bringing them into their rest. And then where do we finish? We finish with God delivering his people from their enemies, judging his enemies and his people entering into their rest, worshiping their king forever and just watching him win. See, how do, how do, we, how do we fight our battles? How do we fight this? We looked at this a little bit last week. Uh, we fight our battles with the weapons of war he has given us. Because we're not trying to win a war. We are standing in the victory that Jesus has already won. So we use the weapons that God has already gifted to us. Does that make sense? And I, I, my hope, in fact, one of my great hopes for this whole series is just that we would stop thinking about Revelation as some future event We'll get to a couple of chapters time where we will talk about future events. So it's not, not future. It is future. But it's so much about what's happening in the world right now uh, and has been happening for the last 2,000 years, who we are in Jesus, the fact that he has already won. And we aren't called to fight a battle in order to win. We are called to fight a battle to overcome, standing in Jesus' already final victory. That's why we see where we are now. That's why we see what he's done before. That's why we see where we're going to finish. So we stand in his victory. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you for the greatness of Jesus, the perfection of our Lord and our Savior, who's already won the battle, victory over death, over Satan. Father, we, we want to stand in that victory. We want to be clothed in those righteous garments. We don't want to live lives of fear, of speculation, but of confidence in who you are 
what you've done, who we are in you. That you have overcome the world and you have called us into union with you in Christ. You're so good to us. We just want to acknowledge you, God, as uh, certainly as glorious and majestic and God over all of creation. Uh, that nothing is difficult for you. We also just want to thank you and acknowledge you in your mercy and your grace towards us, uh, all of us. Thank you. Please help us to not be deceived. Please help us uh, to be living in the power of your Holy Spirit. Please help us to not see people as our enemies. Don't look to um, political movements to try to discern the times or even to put our hope in or to cause us to fear, but all of our hope would be in you and we wouldn't fear at all. Father, we pray this all in Jesus' name and for his sake. And, and Father, even just amongst our uh, Christian brothers and sisters, please help us to be that non-anxious presence, full of your comfort, full of your peace, full of assurance that you've won the battle and we're standing in your victory. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.